Good morning, students. The lyric poem. This is a continuation of the previous PowerPoint. Our poet today is Wilfred Owen. 1893-1918. He is a World War poet. World War One poet. The title of his poem is in Latin, Dulci et Decorum Est. It is a line taken from the Latin odes written by the Roman poet Horace. This slogan, Dulce et Decorum Est, was used by many people during World War I. It means it is sweet and proper to die for one's country. This idea of patriotism aroused the hopes of many young men. But Wilfred Owen who had direct contact and experience with the battlefield and saw what actually went on had a different view. To him, this ideal patriotism was a lie. Wilfred Owen takes the opposite view, it is anything but sweet and proper to die for one's country. Wilfred Owen, 1893-1918, Dulce et Decorum Est. Bent double like old beggars on the sacks, not neat, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshot. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. Again, notice the rhyme scheme. E, F, E, F, G, H, G, H. Alternate rhyme. If in some smothering dreams you two could pace behind the wagon, that we flung him in and watched the white eyes wreathing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie dulci et decorum est pro patria mori. Again the rhyme scheme, alternate rhyme, I J I J K L K L M N M N. But there is no couplet like 
the Shakespearean sonnet. And it is absolutely different from the Petrarchan A B B A A B B A C D E C D E. There is a great difference here. So the poet is imitating or using the traditional Shakespearean sonnet form but in a irregular or not complete sense. The soldiers, Owen tells us, and remember, Wilfred Owen here is conveying an actual experience. He was part of this crew. That is why he is using the pronoun we, and he is speaking about a past experience. The soldiers are bent double. This is a hyperbole. It is an exaggeration. Notice the man in the picture below, how bent he is. He is bent double. The reason why he is bent double is because the soldier is exhausted. The second reason is because they are carrying very heavy sacks, like the second picture. They resemble old beggars, not smart young men marching along in a healthy fashion. No, old beggars. They cough like hags. A hag is an old witch or a witch or an old woman. So these are not healthy men. They are coughing. They are tired. They are exhausted. Their knees are knocking together, meaning they are unable to walk in a straight line because of their heavy load and because of their exhausted state. We cursed through sludge. The word cursed here indicates the very low morale that the soldiers are experiencing. They are not happy. No, they are cursing. Sludge means thick, sticky mud. They are cursing because now even the landscape is against them. The landscape is full of mud that is sticky and very hard to move through. They leave behind them the gas flares and move forward towards their camps. These soldiers, they are not going to fight, they have just finished fighting. They are returning to their camps. The men are so tired, they seem to be sleeping as they trudge, walk through the heavy mud. Because the mud is thick and sticky, many have lost their boots. Yet they continue despite their bare, bleeding, Feet. The image here, the word shod, reminds us of the horse shoes that the horse uses, is, has on his hooves. 
to protect his hooves. In other words, the soldiers have nothing to protect their feet. They are drunk with fatigue. This is a metaphor. They are intoxicated. They are feeling drunk, but not because they drank wine or liquor or any of that sort. No, because they drank fatigue. And because they were exhausted, they did not notice the sound of gas bombs dropping behind them. Suddenly, someone cries out, gas, gas. The soldiers open their sacks to get out their gas masks, getting them just on time. But it wasn't easy. They fumbled. This means, fumbling means, to search for something and not find it although it stands before you. We all experience this feeling from time to time. The word boys describes how young these soldiers were. They weren't old, they weren't mature, they were very young. So they were able to put their helmets on just in time. These helmets are described as being clumsy. The word clumsy here can be considered a pun. The helmets are clumsy, which means that, that they are not perfect. They were not made perfectly. This is World War One and helmets were new inventions. The other meaning of clumsy here, it describes how the soldiers were acting when they put on their helmets. They were very clumsy, unable to put the helmets on properly. One soldier, however, fails to find his mask and is left yelling and struggling and stumbling and falling. Wilfred Owen describes him as suffering like a flounder fish when taken out of the water. The flounder fish moves very quickly from side to side hoping it might fall back into the water and regain its life. This young soldier was as if caught in fire or lime, acid. He was struggling to keep alive. Through the pains of the mask, his mask, Owen compares what he sees through the mask to green water. Why green? Why the color green? Because the poison gas was green. He sees the soldier drowning slowly in that green water. The boy tries to reach out 
to Wilfred Owen, he plunges at me, he throws himself at me, while he is guttering, making noises, onomatopoetic words, making noises with guttering, choking, drowning. Wilfred Owen is now in the present. He is no longer speaking about the past. Owen moves from the past moment of the gas attack to a present moment where he addresses Jessie Pope. He describes to her a recurring dream that haunts him every night. He dreams of the dying soldier trying to reach out to him in agony and pain choking and guttering hoping that Wilfred Owen could save him. Owen tells Jessie Pope, the poetist and novelist, that if she could experience the same suffocating dreams that he had, if she could march behind the wagon which he marched behind, in which the soldier was thrown in like a butchered animal, if she could see the white eyes wreathing in their sockets, on the soldier's pale face, if she could see his face hanging down from the wagon, even the devil who enjoys sin, who encourages sin, was against this type of sin, again a hyperbole. If she could hear the noises he made when the wagon jolted over the bumps in the road, if she could hear his cough and the blood that came with it, the blood and the foam that came from his torn lungs, torn corrupted lungs, which was bitter as the cud of vile. Perhaps here bitter indicates how he felt the sight was bitter because this is an image that indicates taste. Cud, the cow Oh, animals, some animals, they chew the grass and they re-chew it again and it becomes very bitter. I don't here imagine that the poet tasted this cud before. I think he is trying to describe how he felt. He felt very bitter about what he saw and how the soldier suffered. Also, he felt, oh, he was trying to describe how he felt. He felt like if he had sores on his ma in his mouth, sores in his mouth like the picture on your right below. She, Jessie, 
if she had seen all this, if she had experienced all this, she would not so eagerly tell children, hungry for a sense of heroism, the old lie, it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. The life of a soldier is painful and demoralizing. That is Owen's point of view. Death in war is terrible, barbarous, agonizing, and meaningless. There is nothing heroic about it. The sight of the dying soldier is too horrible for even the devil to enjoy or accept. Dulce et Decorum Est was published in 1920. The poem paints a battlefield, scene of soldiers, trudging, walking heavily, along only to be interrupted by poison gas. One soldier does not get his helmet on in time and is thrown on the back of the wagon where he coughs and sputters as he dies. The speaker, who is Wilfred Owen, bitterly and ironically refutes the message that war is glorious and it is an honour to die for one's country. See how the two pictures below show how mud can be a barrier the poem is a combination of two sonnets. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, H, G, H, and so on, with no couplet as Shakespeare used, which reminds us of the Shakespearean sonnet, not the Italian Petrarchan sonnet, which is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, E, C, D, E. The structure is different. This broken structure, sonnet form, and the irregularity reinforce the feeling that we are in another world. The rhyme scheme is traditional, as mentioned above, and each stanza features two quatrains of rhymed iambic pentameter, with several spondaic, a foot of two stressed syllables, substitutions from here the ill irregularity. Dulcie is a message to a poet and civilian propagandist, Jesse Pope, who had written several poems encouraging young men and children to join the war effort. She is the friend of Owen Owen mentions near the end of his poem. The title of the poem, which also appears in the last two lines, is Latin for It is sweet and right to die for one's country, or, more informally, it is an honour to die for one's country. The line derives from the Roman poet Horace's Ode number 3, verse 2. The phrase was commonly used during World War I and thus would have resonated with Owens. In this poem, Owens' objective is to show the horror and reality of war, specifically the First World War, and to set this horror against the way in which war is so often glorified. The glorification of war is reflected in the Latin words taken from an ode by Horace, the poet of ancient Rome, 65 to 8 BC, before Christ. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, Owen chose his opposition to the sentiments of these words specifically by calling them an old lie. They are an old lie because they were said a long time ago, 
in 65 to 68 BC. Owen wants us to be shocked at the reality that he is presenting. He is not afraid to show his own feelings through the use of emotive, away from facts, words such as cursed, obscene, bitter, vile. In the line knock need, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, he again contrasts the horrifying reality with the idealistic way in which war has been presented when soldiers are pictured as singing while marching proudly to their glorious death. This is a picture of how we imagine soldiers should be, how they march, how they sing, as they go to fight, as they go. Okay, Thomas Hardy, the man he killed, this poem has been cancelled from your curriculum. The Imagistic Movement or Imagism Imagism was a movement in early 20th century Anglo-American poetry that favoured precision of imagery and clear, sharp language, unlike the Victorians that used decorative language elaborate language, this movement was against what the Victorians used in their poetry. What is Imagism? It is a style of poetry that focuses on rhyme and meter. Poetry that uses imaginative make-believe language. Poetry that uses simple language with no excess, excess words. Poetry that uses complex formal language. This is imagism. It's nothing apparent about it, but we will see later. As a poetic style, it gave modernism its start in the early 20th century and is the first organized modernist literary, literary movement in the English language. Imagism is a succession of creative moments rather than any continuous or sustained period of development, like a narrative poem or a dramatic one. Imagism called for a return to more classical values Remember, the Victorian age came after the Romantic age, where they relied on imagination. Imagism wants to return once more to the age of reason. Such as what? Such as directness of presentation, economy of language, as well as a willingness to experiment with non-traditional verse forms. Thus, images use free verse. Not all of them, of course, but most of them. They use free verse. What is free verse? It is poetry with rhyme, but no meter. It is poetry with meter, but no rhyme. It is poetry with no meter or rhyme. And it is poetry with meter and rhyme. You can find all this in free verse. A characteristic feature of imagism is its attempt to isolate a single image to reveal its essence. 
Ezra Pound, Amy Lowell, Lowell, Hilda Doolittle, Richard Aldington are images poets interested in exploring Greek poetic models, especially Sappho. The images also imitated the Japanese haiku poetry. The direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective, to use absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. As regarding rhythm, to compose in sequence of the musical phrase, the spoken phrase, not in the se sequence of the metronome, that is, rhythm by fixed accented and accented syllables. Amy Lowell, the imagist poetess, attempted to set down some criteria for writers of imagist poetry. She wrote, they should strive to use the language of common speech, not poetic diction, language that is difficult to understand, to create new, new rhythms, To allow absolute freedom in the choice of subject, any subject can be subject to poetry. To present an image, just one image. To produce poetry that is hard and clear, never blurred nor indefinite. Finally, most of us believe that concentration, precision, is of the very essence of poetry. The Japanese haiku poetry became popular in Japan during the 9th and 12th centuries. Haiku poetry is full of metaphors and personifications. Haikus are written on objective experiences and at times subjective ones. The features of haiku. A haiku is a poem that contains three lines. These three lines have a specific structure. The first line has five syllables. The second line consists of seven syllables and the last line consists of five syllables. The poem contains 17 syllables in total. A haiku poem does not rhyme. Haiku poems frequently have what is known as a kigo or seasonal reference. The poet refers to spring, to summer, to autumn and winter. Haiku poems are usually about nature or natural phenomena. The poem has two juxtaposed subjects that are divided into two contrasting. These are two examples of haiku poems. Haikus are short poems written on topics and things that the readers can identify with easily. For example, season and animals are readily recognizable topics to readers. The first haiku, dew drops on the grass. They sparkle through the morning. Everything is wet. You are left to your imagination. Imagine what you want. The meaning is clear and apparent. A rainbow. Curving up then down. 
meeting blue sky and green earth, melding sun and rain. Again, the words are simple. There is only one image and the poet here leaves you to your imagination. Imagine what you want. Two more poems that are cancelled. Langston Hughes, the poem Bad Morning, and County Cullen for a Lady I Know. These are cancelled also. The end of this PowerPoint. The next will be on the dramatic poem. Thank you.